we'll be going over paragraph four today, but before we do, I want to just briefly recap what has been discussed so far in uh, chapter 11 of justification. I'll quickly go over the first three paragraphs. And in paragraph one, we looked at what justification is, uh, which is God declaring a sinner righteous on the merit of Christ's righteousness. This declaration or verdict consists of two parts. The first is the forgiveness of sins, which is accomplished by Christ's passive obedience in his death on the cross. And the second is the imputation of his perfect righteousness, which is accomplished by his active obedience unto the whole law. So both of these are essential, the forgiveness of our sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness, because only by them can we have total assurance that we have peace with God. And you can't really have one without the other as well. Uh, the two are inseparable, uh, and we, are, we have eternal life because we are pardoned from our sins, uh, the debt penalty that we had uh, for our sins, and we are also counted as righteous because of Christ's righteousness. Uh, in addition to that, we also went over the difference between what infused righteousness is and also imputed righteousness. Uh, it's important to draw a distinction between the two because um, sometimes I get confused because they sound similar, uh, but they're two very different things. Uh, infused righteousness implies that Christ's righteousness is merely added or mixed with ours. Uh, in other words, as his righteousness is infused into us, we become inherently uh, righteous ourselves. It's denying the sufficiency of grace alone to justify, uh, and it's adding in uh, works, uh, our works. Um, and this is what most, uh, if not all, religions in the world today believe. Uh, the Catholics believe that justification is a result of our faith plus works like baptism and the performing of sacraments. Uh, and not only them, but also Mormons as well. Uh, they believe in something similar. If you guys are familiar with the Book of Mormon, you know that there's a passage in there that talks about, uh, that, that says that, you know, we are saved by grace, uh, which, which to us, we would have no issue with. Um, we would, I'm pretty sure all of us would say amen to, except it adds a phrase to the end of that and says, after all, we can do. Uh, so it, it puts an emphasis on uh, the works itself or puts an emphasis on human performance uh, in, in the salvation. Uh, and this kind of teaching is very dangerous because it can destroy the chance of uh, true saving faith. Uh, and it makes a person think that they can contribute something to their salvation. Uh, it gives them a false sense of assurance if they're doing well or maybe no assurance at all, actually. Uh, and the opposite of infused righteousness is imputed righteousness. Uh, we, we said that this means that there is a transfer of Christ's righteousness onto sinners. His righteousness is what's credited to us uh, so that he alone becomes our righteousness. Uh, we, are not, we, we do not play a part in that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him to be sin uh, who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, this way, even though the sinner is not fully righteous because he is still in the flesh, God can still legally declare him to be so uh, and do so instantaneously because of Christ's merits. It, it's all through Christ's efforts, uh, not our own, uh, so that God alone would get the glory. And that's why on Judgment Day, when God sees us, He doesn't see our righteousness, a part of, a part of Christ's righteousness and also part of ours, but only Christ. Uh, and this is good news to us because we know that in Isaiah it says that um, to God, all of our good works, even, even our best works, uh, are as filthy rags to God. And it would be foolish for us to think that we can stand before God uh, a holy God with any bit, any merit of our own. It's Isaiah sixty four six. Isaiah sixty four six. Thank you. Uh, and and yeah, this is what this is what most of the religions uh, or most people believe is necessary to be right with God today. So that was paragraph one, uh, and then paragraph two, we talked about the instrument of justification. Uh, we read that that is faith. So faith is not the basis, or is not righteousness itself, uh, but that um, it is it is rather Christ who is the grounds of our righteousness, uh, but through faith we receive or attain the justification or the righteousness of Christ. Uh, and we saw that in Romans 4, 5, which says that, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. 
Um, so for us, it is to receive. It's in the moment that we believe that Christ's righteousness is given unto us, and that is faith, and, and faith is the instrument of that. Uh, Galatians 2.16, I want to share another verse, says that, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Um, and, and this faith is not something that occurs within the believer or occurs uh, in the person justified alone, um, but it's something that, uh, that God has to give to us. Uh, there is nothing that we did in and of ourselves uh, to uh, muster up this faith so, so that it could be something that we boast about. Instead, it's accompanied just like every other saving grace. Uh, just like uh, the effectual call and the adoption, uh, which we'll go over in, in the next chapter. Uh, and God receives all the credit, again, for our justification because this faith comes from Him. Uh, on the contrary, we also discuss what, what dead faith is. We said that dead faith is not something that is not from God. Uh, it's the opposite of living faith. And when James is talking about this, he's not talking about uh, he's not contradicting uh, what, what the rest of Scripture says about justification by faith alone, but he's, merely he's just merely telling us to distinguish between that there are two kinds of faiths in this world. There's the living, uh, and then there's also the dead faith. Uh, true and living faith will always lead to good works and active obedience. Uh, there's a desire to do the will of God by loving Him and loving others, fulfilling the, the two greatest commandments. Uh, whereas faith that is only by knowledge, uh, merely just intellectual and does not merely just intellectual and does not have any fruit, uh, may not may be a sign that it's not genuine uh, saving faith. And so we have to be careful that it's not merely just the, the profession pr profession of faith or just saying that we have faith that saves us, but that we actually possess it and uh, that we have uh, true and living faith. And lastly, uh, just one more paragraph, paragraph three, the object of justification. Uh, so last week we looked at, um, so we again, faith is the instrument of our justification, but it's not the righteousness that's imputed to us. The, the actual object of our justification is Christ's obedience, uh, and it's also his death. Uh, so he was put forward as our propitiation because God cannot simply forget our sins. He can't just sweep our sins under the rug. Uh, and if he did, he would not be a just judge. Uh, Proverbs 17, 15 actually says that he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So uh, his justice, because God is just, he demanded that sin to be handled and uh, rightfully punished. Uh, but in order that he would also be the justifier of the one who has faith, he put forward his son as a propitiation by his blood uh, so that Jesus Christ and his blood would legitimately, really, and fully satisfy God's justice on our behalf. Uh, his substitutionary death and not anything in us is what, God, uh, is what turned God's wrath toward us uh, into his favor. Uh, and so again, this is, just how, this is how God can both be just uh, and the justifier of our faith. Uh, and then we also saw that justification is based entirely on free grace, and is, it is so because it pleased him to be glorified by it. Um, Ephesians 2 verses 4 to 7 says, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He, will not, only, he not only decreed to justify sinners by, he, by his grace, but he desired to do so because it gave him all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Uh, so that was just, um, hopefully that was a, a brief and quick recap of what we discussed so far in chapter 11. Um, yes. Yeah, just on what you based everything on, uh, uh, the, the, the prerequisite uh, to faith is uh, regeneration. And uh, mm -hmm. also, Henry Scugo in 1640, uh, regeneration is the life of God in the soul of man. And Whitfield was saved by that, Wesley was saved by that book. I handed out that book in here. It's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And that could be a good definition 
of regeneration. But uh, our whole, the whole, the whole uh, of our justification, uh, the ground is uh, Christ's obedience and also his righteousness, right. which is imputed at that particular time. But I find that that doctrine of regeneration is not preaching, uh, being preached in other churches. And uh, so therefore, uh, the soul is saved at the moment that we're regenerated and there's life in the soul. So faith leads to righteousness is what we need, is a perfect righteousness in order to get into heaven. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I think like that's exactly what we're going to talk about today in paragraph four, which is the time, uh, or I guess like when we are actually justified. And so uh, there's an argument, and I'm going to go into it later as well, of uh, eternal justification. So um, when Christ justified us on the cross, um, because of that, we are born justified already. Well, yeah, well there's two. There's that's, eternal justification and there's justification at the, uh, at the cross which none of them kick into the believer, but I'll listen to what you have to say. Right, right, yeah. Um, and so I um, want to look at paragraph four today. Oh, well, actually, any, any questions on the first three paragraphs or anything that we said so far? Okay, cool. So paragraph four, um, and here we'll t address the, the timing of justification or when justification itself is applied uh, to the believer. Um, and so I have that printed out for you. Uh, so if you look at your handout, um, I'll read it. It says, from all eternity, God decreed to justify all the elect. And at the appropriate time, Christ died for their sins and rose again for their justification. At the same time, they are not justified personally until the Holy Spirit at the proper time actually applies Christ to them. And so the way that I wanted to break up this paragraph, um, and I think it makes uh, three important distinctions here, is uh, first, when did God decree our justification, uh, which is separate from when God actually applied justification or accomplished justification, uh, which is the second question. And then the third question is, when does God apply justification? So. The three, question, the three main questions that we're going to uh, go over today is, when does God decree justification? When does he accomplish it? And when does he apply it? And we'll look at each of these in depth, starting with the first, uh, when God decrees justification. Um, and so, uh, as, as Bob here mentioned, uh, in Romans 8, we find the, the order of salutis, and it talks about, it, it, Romans 8.29 says, for those who whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Um, in the last chapter, we covered the effectual call, and that itself uh, is, Christ, is God himself uh, from all eternity past, uh, calling the uh, uh, predetermining uh, so that uh, he will be able to call uh, those who are the elect. Um, and here in, in the verse Romans 8.29, the word foreknew uh, is not a reference sim simply to God's omniscience or that from eternity past, he knew who was going to choose him. Uh, and, and so that's why, or, cho or choose to come to Christ. And that's why he, he gave them saving grace. Uh, but it's to show that he had a, he had a, he predetermined, uh, had a predetermined choice of those who would come to him and to be in relationship with Christ. God himself was sovereign over that decision, and he predetermined it. Uh, the word uh, foreknew or foreknowledge also appears in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Uh, and and in, both, in both of these verses, we can interpret it as God, bringing, God himself bringing the salvific relationship into existence by decreeing it uh, ahead of time. Um, and therefore, it was planned. It, it was something that was planned before the foundation of the world, uh, something that Christ, that, that Christ himself would be the sacrifice for sins so that we should be holy and blameless before him. Um, 
this is again uh, something what the, the like the, the Armenians would believe that God that God Himself looked forward into time, uh, and He saw who would come to Christ, and as a result, choose them. Uh, but uh, in, but but that's unbiblical. Uh, scripture actually says that God aimed from eternity past uh, who the elect would be, and and He chose them in order to make them like Christ. Yeah. So what's wrong specifically with God looking down the corridors of time in and of itself? Right. Like, like what's, what's the major problem with that? It's to say that God is not um, himself. He himself would not get all the glory for the salvation of man. Um, sure. But also, if God has to look down the corridors of time, he has to learn something. Mm -hmm. If God has to learn something, there's a problem with God. Does that mean that he's not omniscient? It means he's not omniscient. Yeah. He's not all-powerful, and he's not all-knowing. Because he created time, and now he has to submit to this entity of time that he created. So then time is almost above God. He's beneath, mm. he would have to be beneath time. Creates a major problem for the Arminians. God doesn't have to learn anything. Yeah. Right? So when they say that, they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth. And so that's a good question to posit to an Arminian. How do they reconcile? God is learning something. And he knows all things. Hmm. If you know all things, you don't have to learn anything. Right. Oh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. But you see, an important thing on what Elder Phil said is down the line, it's a decision that we will make. We will come to Christ in 1954, 1962, 1976. By the evangelist pleading, come down. You know that Christ died for you, don't you? Yes. You know that you did, yes, and so forth. So that is a tremendous problem where in Ephesians 1, 5, it says that he loved us, not that we loved him. And also before that, what you were saying is I think that we should show that God the Father is in charge of this redemption, that he is the agent. And we see that in Jesus Christ, always giving glory to the Father. Very, very few churches speak about God and the Holy Spirit. And uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, I hate to bring him in, but John MacArthur says he brings God to the pulpit. Also, Steve Lawson on his biography, which I handed out in here, says yeah. that Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of the only preachers that bring God. So it's God who, with this redemption, that should really get all the credit. He sent his son. His son in John 17 mm -hmm. glorified that father all the time. And it's something where uh, he has taught me, Dr. Jones, and the Bible to give God all that glory that he deserves. Mm -hmm. He is the agent on this uh, redemption. It's his plan. Yeah. He originated it. He's the originator. He's the agent. Yeah. And we see in, in Galatians 3, 8, um, another verse that talks about um, God foreseeing. Um, says that Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith um, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. The word foresee here is spoken of something that the Scriptures are doing, um, but the Scriptures itself are inspired by God. And so we can say the same thing as God uh, foreseeing the blessing of the Gentiles. Um, and so all the, all the people that we see in the, in the Old Testament that are saved, they're also saved by faith. Um, and, and the Gentiles are also saved by faith, uh, as did the characters in the, in the Old Testament, like Abraham. Um, and, and it's saved not by some, grace, first of all. Saved by grace, yeah, through faith. Through faith. Yeah. Uh, and it can never be accomplished by works or of obedience to the law of Moses. Uh, so therefore, regardless of Jew or Gentile, salvation has and always will be uh, through faith. Uh, so here uh, we answer the question, um, 
how God or when God uh, decreed our justification. And that was from eternity past. Um, the second question I want us to look at is, uh, when was justification itself accomplished? Uh, so Christ, we, we read uh, in, in the last paragraph uh, that the object of our justification is Christ's death and his obedience. Um, he willingly gave up his life. Uh, he gave up his life as a ransom for many. Uh, we read that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. Christ gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. Um, it, it reminds us similar to what Christ himself said in, in Matthew chapter 20, where he said he will give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, and ransom here means payment. Uh, ransom is something that you would pay uh, in order to release a prisoner. It's something that's demanded or something that's paid off uh, to free someone. Uh, and Christ himself was that payment. He, he bore our sins onto his own body, and he became the ransom himself. Uh, and he died the death that, that we deserve to die um, by putting on our sins onto himself uh, so that we could be free. Uh, we could be free, um, free, free not just so that we can live uh, however we choose, but free from the debt of sin, from the wrath of God uh, that was to come. Um, that is to come. Uh, and, and again, uh, I don't know if I have First Timothy there uh, for you, but um, it says Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. Uh, the word all here means that it, it should be understood in the sense that Christ's death, uh, though it was sufficient to cover all, everyone's sin if, if he chose to do so, it's not like Christ's sacrifice was lacking in any way. Um, it was sufficient to cover all sins, uh, but he he chose and he predetermined. God predetermined that it would only atone uh, for the sins of the elect alone, and it, and it pleased him to do. It pleased him, and it, and it was his desire and his uh, decision to do so. So, yeah. brother Paul, going back to the Arminian theology, so what, what's the problem there for when? It's believed that he died for all people, and 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 his blood was was shed. Right. But, but it doesn't. I mean, we know everybody's not saved. Mm -hmm. so if everybody's not saved, like, what problem is presented for the, for the Armenian? Right. Because if if Christ did die for all, um, then as a result, everyone should be saved. Everyone should be in heaven. Um, no one should be going to hell um, because it's, it's, it's Christ alone. Um, and if, if, we are truly, if we truly hold to that and believe that it is Christ alone, um, then no one should be going to hell. And so that's, I think that's the issue um, where if the, argu if the argument is um, that, yeah, Christ it was a ransom for, for all people, for all sinners. And, and, and when you think about it, if the, if the belief that you could choose Christ, right, that he died for those that would, he, he died for all, so, so all could come, then it's possible that none, could, that none would come. It's, it's possible then, if it's up to only the choice of, of man, that no one would choose Christ and that he shed his blood in vain because, in fact, then no one would have been saved. Right. So again, the Arminian theology, it's, I don't know, it's ungodly. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. it, it because it, it, it so cheapens the blood and the sacrifice of Christ, right? Redemption mm -hmm. accomplished and applied. And Mr. Excellent. Yes, sir. And applied. Uh, redemption accomplished and applied by John Murray. Elder Phil know that one. <laughs> Uh, I was also going to add that um, that it, it also means that Christ is not mighty to save because people can choose and people can resist. Yeah. But then, like Psalm fourteen two to three says, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there if there are any who understand to seek after God. Mm -hmm. Then it says they have all turned aside together; they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So it's like no one does. Well, it's 
Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then Paul repeats that in Romans 3. And then in Psalm 15, 3, who, uh, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. Not all that man pleases. Hmm. He does all that he pleases. So if he says, I'm going to save Paul Joe on this date, he's going to save Paul Joe on that date. Paul Joe's not going to say, Oh, it's not my time yet. <laughs> you know, I want to go and sow my wild, wild oats for a couple more years. And then I'll come when I'm ready because I make the decision after all. <laughs> then he's not God. Yeah. But when you go to John 6, 37, all of the Father gives to me will come. I will um, lose yeah. none. Ephesians 2, 1, we're dead in sins and trespasses. Read John 17. He's speaking about those ones that I knew, Jesus is saying to his Father. Yeah. It's just showing those three verses that I just gave you show conclusively that it's a certain select uh, that God has decided to save. It's called a remnant that's saved by grace alone. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, God will not lose a single one um, of his sheep, not a single one that he has planned. Um, amen. Um, and, and the other, other side is, is um, Christ's resurrection. Um, so Christ's death itself uh, was um, the forgiveness of sins. It, it, was, it was in order to forgive us of our sins. Uh, but Christ's resurrection, uh, the resurrection of Christ itself, um, Christ coming alive again, uh, the empty tomb is a sign from God that he marked his approval um, of Christ's sacrifice, uh, that he accepted it. Um, the resurrection, um, it, it, it shows, it demonstrates that Christ was not just some, it was not just another person who was uh, merely just claiming himself self uh, proclaiming to be the Messiah or um, you're just some deluded figure saying that um, but that he himself um, was was who he said he was he was the son of God um, because you know he could not possibly be the son of God if, if he were to die the death right uh, if he was to die as a, as a crucified uh, criminal and just stay dead um, I like what, how one author says it. He says that Christ um, was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Uh, and, and because, you know, the things that Christ was saying was very unique. Um, you know, you, you didn't have people at the time uh, going around saying that, he, that they were the Lord or that they were the Son of God. Um, the resurrection proved uh, that Christ was truly who he said that he was. Um, and, and, and the resurrection also, in a sense, proves that Christ was justified. It showed that Christ was justified before the whole world. His resurrection showed that, and it was a testimony. Um, but what are, some, what are some other reasons why the resurrection is important for Christians? Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Well, it shows that you should really read Romans 1-4, I believe it is, that says the whole thing when we go to the Bible. You should really read that. But it authenticated the sacrifice, God, uh, the sacrifice, in other words, authenticated that uh, what uh, Mr. Nakota said, that he is the son of God. But uh, could you read Romans 1-4? I, I would really appreciate it, you know, because uh, that's showing by the resurrection on what you're saying. You see, the Bible is bringing out, the verses is bringing out what you're saying on uh, the resurrection. But it was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ where we're saved. The resurrection was definitely guaranteed. But churches are preaching, now that Christ rose from the dead, you can walk the Sermon on the Mount, you can keep the, the Ten Commandments. They're preaching the life because of that. That was guaranteed. Christ knew that he was going to be resurrected. When Phil Sessa preached 150 sermons on Jonah, he's in the belly of the fish. <laughs> he, he, he knew it. You know, what was coming down? You know, I'm sorry, I'm just bringing up on John. <laughs> so, what does it say? Can anyone say, give that no. verse? Uh, that's a great verse oh, in Romans that. where he was uh, resurrected. It says, uh, I, I would appreciate my glasses. Uh, I'm not getting younger. Romans, Romans 1 4. I got it. Um, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. 
Could you repeat that again? And was declared to be the Son of God and power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why mm. you come with the verses. It's showing exactly what you said. No? Yeah, amen. He's also uh, the he... first fruits. Mm -hmm. What happened to him will happen to us. Um, because he died and rose, we will die and rise. If he, that's if, if you go through all of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, exactly. there mm -hmm. were people who were saying that they were Christians but denying the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, <laughs> the Apostle Paul says, we're to be pitied among all men of the earth. Yeah. Because we're liars, we believe in something that is not going to happen, our faith is in vain. But if it is true, don't pity us. We're yeah. not liars. Yeah. And our faith is not in vain. It's in Christ who rose from the grave. And so um, what happened to him in his resurrection, he showed that where I am, you will be also. Yeah. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I was, I, was, uh, I was driving through like Manhattan and looking at all these buildings. And it's like, man, if man could make all of these high skyscrapers with all this fancy technology and stuff. What could Christ make when he says, I go to prepare a place for you? Mm. Yeah. Amen. So what Phil was I, saying, yeah, the first... whole thing is when Christ died, I died. Mm -hmm. You go to Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with him, nevertheless I live. I'm not going to yeah. go to the rest of the bit. But when Christ was resurrected, I was resurrected. So that comes first. At the moment of salvation, when Christ died, those sins were paid for. Going to uh, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we do not serve sin. Yeah. And then from there you go to Galatians 2.20. So that's the whole thing, the death of Christ on the Lord's Supper. This is one of the only churches that I know that is preaching the death of Christ. That's what we remember of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, uh, as I say, I always hold on to that resurrection. Uh, I love the resurrection, but that was like guaranteed. Christ knew that, and it mm -hmm. is what you said, everything that you said on that. Yeah, if, if we were united with him exactly. uh, in a death like his, we will also be resurrected, and that's why we have hope um, in, in a resurrection like his. Um, were, were you going to say something, no, no, Michael? The, the other thing I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so just to summarize, yeah, if, if Christ has not been raised, and this is the verse from 1 Corinthians 15, um, if Christ himself has not been raised, then, then our faith is futile and, and we're still in our sins. Um, we are of all people to be most pitied. Um, however, the resurrection um, itself not only involves uh, Christ's justification, and I, I want to be careful with that. Uh, I'm not saying that Christ himself was a sinner. Christ himself did not need to be made or declared right before God, um, but it was to show uh, Christ. Christ's uh, justification um, was to show that, um, sorry. Um, Christ's justification was to show. Yeah, it was, it was to show um, the surety of our justification um, because had he not been raised, uh, we would we would not have a vindicator. Um, so to to summarize again uh, what we have said so far in this paragraph, we talked about God decreeing our justification uh, from eternity past, uh, and He accomplished it at a point in history uh, at the appropriate time when Christ Himself died and rose from the dead. Uh, the the final and last question that I want us to look at is. Uh, when, it, when is justification applied? Um, or, or when does God actually declare a believer to be righteous? Is it something that took place already in the past or something that happens in the future? Um, what, do you, what do you guys think? Is, is it something that happened in the past or is it something that happens in the future for justification? Uh, can I answer? Yeah. Because it's uh, we're going to miss two things, which is very important. Uh, a big time pastor, if there's such a thing as that, uh, really, I tripped him up maybe because he wasn't thinking clearly. He said we're justified in eternity, no good. 
And then he, I, I said, well, we justified it before. So he says, yeah, no good. Uh, we justified the moment that we believed because I didn't know whether he would get that in or not. Mm -hmm. People think, well, you're elect, you're justified before eternity, no good. The Bible calls us to believe. I could give five verses where we're commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so it actually kicks in or when we believe. I don't know if you were going to say that. I know you had it on there. But yeah. it's very, very important that people will say, I was justified at the cross when Christ died. No, God will not believe and God will not repent for Robert Gypsy. I had to do it. And it was by the power of the Holy Spirit that I did this. Right. Uh, and I would agree with you. I think that it, it is when at the moment we believe. That's when we're justified. Um, but I only bring it up because um, there are some parts of Scripture um, where where justification itself can be seen as something that, that happens in the future. And, and again, I just want to um, just preface it by saying that I agree with uh, what, what Bob is here saying, um, that it happens at the moment uh, when we believe. Uh, but in regards to some of those uh, passages that I'm talking about, uh, it's Romans 2.13 says, For it is not the hearer of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Uh, meaning that, or suggesting that um, that they will be justified at, at some later time, or First Corinthians. No, yeah, the yeah. Justification. Right. You can't do that in God's sight unless you're justified. Then the Holy Spirit's working principally in you to do it. Go on. Right. Uh, and First Corinthians four four, which says, "For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me." Uh, and Galatians 5.5, 5, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Um, so these parts of Scripture, uh, some can argue um, that justification is something that will happen uh, in the future. Um, other parts of Scripture refer to justification as something that has already occurred or something that has already passed. Uh, so we'll see that in... Uh, uh, Romans Romans 5 1 therefore since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and 1st Corinthians 6 11 but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God um, and so how can we how can we reconcile the two uh, some passages say that yeah that that it is something that, that we are waiting or something that e we are eagerly waiting for, uh, whereas some say that we have already been justified. Um, so just to, just to kind of elaborate on that point, we, we recall that justification is God declaring a sinner to be righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Um, this righteousness is accomplished through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and it is by faith Believers are united to him and no longer in Adam, uh, no longer under the curse of Adam. Uh, Christ's status becomes our status, uh, and the righteousness by which Christ was justified is the same by which we will be as well. Um, uh, and, and the justification of Christ, uh, 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 but yeah, uh, but although we are declared righteous, we ourselves have not appeared before the judgment seat of God yet. Uh, this is something that will happen on Judgment Day, something that will happen in the future. Um, and in Galatians, even Galatians 5.5 5 says that Paul is looking forward to it. He's looking forward with confidence uh, to, to, hear, to hear from God himself the declaration uh, that he was declared to be right. Uh, and only those who believe uh, will be found before the divine court of God to be right. Um, so even though we ourselves haven't appeared, we, are, we know essentially that we are justified. Um, we, like Paul, can also look forward to the day when the declaration of our justification uh, will be made public to the entire world, just like um, Christ's resurrection when it was made public to the entire world. And so in this sense, you can say that justification is something that is already uh, but not yet, uh, is, is an already but not yet reality. Um, where we're taking part in the kingdom of God already, uh, but it's not going to reach its full expression until sometime, some, some later point in time. 
Does does that make is that clear or well, are there any I questions would just about that? Say that you know, as far as assurance, it takes a long time for a person to uh, have, but you gotta have that confidence. That that's it's a done deal. All your sins, my sins were paid for, past, present, and future. I know that I'm going to heaven on what Christ did for me. Yeah. As far as that's like what you were saying is like very difficult to grasp because it's waiting to wit the verse that you were looking to it, the redemption of our body. That's maybe Romans eight eighteen. So that's when everything kicks in. But as far as our justification is concerned, you got to go back to that auto salute is really and show the stages regeneration one conversion saving faith justification is number four yeah. but to really show that that is the doctrine that i know that right now i am justified i can stand before the living god mm. and uh i mean i would be shocked if he sentenced me to hell i mean not a mouth would be opened up before him but yeah. i am justified when i believed and that's it so they can't you can't take really that away from me i have that confidence i have that assurance to enter into heaven the track yeah. that i wrote says if you were to die right now what would happen to you and basically i asked that so that's very important on this doctrine of justification uh, yeah and uh you know i think what you were saying when waiting to wit the redemption of our body our body's not saved when you believe you have a saved soul that's why it's saying the life of God and the soul of man by Schugel, it's regenerated the soul. You have a body that lusts after flesh, so. Yeah, and, and I think like to some, it might sound prideful to say that we know where we're gonna go um, when we die. But again, the grounds is not because, um, because yeah, we are any good in ourselves or because uh, we ourselves have a greater faith than other people. Um, but it is resting on the sure promise of Christ. But I have believers, yeah. solid believers, yeah. that say they hope they'll be up there. I say to them very kindly, and every, why do you say you hope you'll be up there? Yep. I mean, you, you should have that assurance if you've really been a Christian for 40 years that you know you'd be up there on what Christ did yep. for me at the cross, a vile, wretched sinner. That's all I can say to the Father yep. when, when I go before him. I don't want to sin, but your son died for me. Yeah. Amen. Um, and I just want to, I know we have a few more minutes or maybe we're running out of time, um, but I do want to finish up and just say that, um, you know, this is not to be confused with what, um, what we said earlier about eternal justification or something that the, the antinomians believe. Um, they believe that um, Christ, because Christ has justified you, you are already justified. Um, again, yeah, this is something that we brought up before. Um, and, you know, you're completely freed by grace from the, they believe that you're freed by the grace uh, from, the, from having to keep the law. Uh, from obeying the law and they'll reject the very you know uh, the idea of obedience as and to push it off as something that's legalistic um, and rather it's just you know you have the Holy Spirit in you so you know you're always uh, going to do good uh, and you're always just um, but again that's not what we're saying here we're saying that faith uh, we're saying that you are justified at the moment you believe um, faith is if, if you were to believe the, the the former you're saying that faith is no longer the instrument but it's it's the result of justification um and, and when you come to faith you're just recognizing you're merely just recognizing the fact that you're justified um it takes away um yeah faith being the instrument to receive justification um, by saying that faith is the fruit of justification um and, and we see many places in scripture that defend this uh, you know, Colossians 1 says, you were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Uh, so at one point in your life, you were not justified, but now that now you are um, at the moment that you believe. Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Romans 5, 10 says, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Um, and so... Again, the, the point 
I'm trying to make is that there are, there are three different distinctions that we have to make of justification and its timing. When God decreed justification, uh, when justification itself was accomplished, uh, and when justification occurs in the life of the believer. Um, any questions on that? Or, or the three uh, questions that we talked about? Okay. And, and just one last thing. Um, I think like... The, the beauty of this um, is we get to see the whole work um, actions from all three part persons of the Trinity. We see the Father himself decreeing um, that, that sinners would be justified, that his elect would be justified. We'll also see his son uh, himself dying on the cross, uh, himself at the appropriate time, laying his life as a ransom uh, and and. And completing the justification or, or himself being dying and rising again for our justification and then also the Holy Spirit applying that justification unto believers so if there's no questions um, I can close this out uh, with a word of prayer Heavenly Father Lord we thank you for uh, this this study, Lord, we thank you for the doctrine of justification. Oh God, uh, Lord, you who are a holy uh, and righteous and good judge could have never uh, justified us sinners. Um, Lord, if it wasn't uh, for your son and his blood. Uh, Lord, thank you for sending Christ. Lord, thank you for... Uh, Thank you, for, thank you for Christ's willingness to die on the cross uh, for us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the freedom uh, from sin and, and the righteousness that we have in Christ. Lord, I pray that this would be something that we would uh, continue to meditate, continue to think upon. Um, Lord, that we would truly know you, truly know, um, Lord, how you have saved us uh, and, and have greater assurance in it because it was all Christ uh, and not uh, anything in and of ourselves. Uh, we give you all the glory uh, and all the praise for our salvation. Lord, I do pray for today's service. Um, Lord, I pray that, um, Lord, your word uh, would be heard. It would be received. Uh, Lord, that it would go forth in power and in unction uh, from the pulpit, Lord, to the pews. And Lord, that souls today, um, Lord, if they're not saved, Lord, would be saved. Uh, Lord, and if they are, Lord, they would be encouraged, uh, challenged, uh, and that they would uh, see Christ and see him more, more beautifully um, as a result. Uh, thank you for this day, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.